Legend has it that the great 14th century warrior emperor Tamerlane warned that if anyone interfered with his grave, the world would, as he put it, tremble with unimaginable suffering. Almost 40 years ago, Soviet archaeologists did just that, and one day later, the German armies swept into Russia. Rather more sensitivity and restraint marks the Soviets' firm approach to their 40 million Muslims as they try to at once control their strength and respect their traditions. With people from Muslim backgrounds expected to form two-fifths of the entire Soviet population by the year 2000, some Western observers argue that a threat to the country's internal security cannot be ruled out. But we found that on the surface at least, Islam here has become the opium of old men, that increasingly the younger generation are abandoning the faith of centuries, are being persuaded there is little need for it in a strong atheist society which although on paper might profess to tolerate the gods of many religions, in practice recognizes and encourages none. And the government's massive program of modernization bringing water and tower blocks to the desert cities conquered by Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great is proving a more than effective answer to the call of Islam. As the Shah of Iran found out to his cost, those who would modernize an Islamic state should step slowly and with care. The Soviet Union has been doing just that for a full 60 years. In 1920, the first woman ever to appear on stage here in Tashkent was murdered. So too were any who dared to remove their veils in public. Now the region's stadiums have workouts for women athletes who would once have been stoned to death for daring to appear in public so scantily dressed. At one time excluded totally from public life, women now form 40% of the area's workforce. We came across these laying a new tarmac road just outside a mosque saw others acting as platform guards on the Tashkent metro, found others in a factory doing the toughest and dirtiest of jobs, and still more in a local library, being given the kind of educational opportunities that caused so much Muslim opposition when introduced last year by the Soviet-backed government in neighboring Afghanistan. And as they sprawl around the public lakes and recreation areas in the 100 degree summer heat, any traditional inhibitions these women might feel are clearly as minimal as their costumes. The children, head shaven because of the heat, are now enjoying school holidays. But when back in the classroom, they plunge into a world of Marxist-Leninist ideology, in which political propaganda has completely replaced religious education. We have our own ideology. We don't need religion here, a senior local official told me. So more and more people, like factory worker Mohammed Jan, are growing up with the new way of life and being seduced by it. Born of still practicing Muslim parents, he himself no longer goes to the mosque. His cap is his only concession to the past. Complete change on the monumental scale envisaged by the Soviet government is by definition a slow business. In the Arab-type market, the old style of trading is slowly being replaced. Most have succumbed to the attractions of formica shelving and a new covered market that would not be out of place in many Western towns. The Soviets claim that the standard of living of the Uzbek people is better than that of any of their Islamic neighbors. They point out that before the revolution, only 2% of them could read and write. Now the figure is 90%, compared, for example, to 10% in Afghanistan. Some Russian customs, like their love of gold teeth, have been imported along with their ideas. But the Soviets have gone out of their way to preserve many Uzbek traditions not associated directly with Islam. Uzbek eating houses, for example, with their highly exotic food, are spread throughout most towns and cities. And if the jukebox does offer the Rolling Stones playing Lady Jane, then at least it does so in both Russian and Uzbek. and the national dances of Uzbekistan are given the official seal of approval. Local pride in Uzbek nationalism, for generations bound up so closely with Islam, seems now to have been successfully prized away from it. And as Islam declines, the Soviets are confident enough to turn the finest mosques and religious schools into museums, into tourist attractions. Soviet Central Asia has only 200 large registered mosques. Before the revolution, it had 24,000. 
only 1,000 registered mullahs, where once there were tens of thousands. Islam requires a believer once in his life to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. From the Soviet Union, only a few dozen make that journey each year. So the Ayatollah Khomeini and Saudi Arabia have actually suggested that the Soviet Union is an enemy of Islam. Where in their countries, for example, could you possibly contemplate, as here in Samarkand, a vodka factory nestling in the shadows of the mosques? With statues of two famous Muslim poets, Jalil and Nawai, actually looking over into its backyard. But the allegations strike deeper than that into Islam's foundations, and the Soviets have gone on a propaganda offensive to try and disprove them. The latest edition of their glossy Muslim magazine, published in Arabic, Persian, French and English, quotes from the Quran, reminding readers that the person who doesn't work in his own interest and the interest of others will never receive any remuneration from the almighty Allah. And at his Tashkent headquarters, the deputy leader of Soviet Muslims made it clear to me that in his view, those interests can even be those of an atheist state. He argues that here, as all over the world, many people are drifting away from religion, but claims Soviet Islam is stronger than critics suggest. The difference lies in social habits. People work and study, he says, and don't always have time to pray in a mosque. I asked if an Islamic revolution was possible here. Religious leaders should not interfere in politics, was the firm answer. Did that apply to Iran too? A smile, a pause, perhaps some embarrassment as he listened to our interpreter. And then the diplomatic reply, the Iranians must decide their own affairs. Critics say that Dr. Yusuf Khan Shakirov is one of the tame mufti permitted to operate in the Soviet system. We certainly noticed that a colleague took copious notes of his answers whenever I asked a question that was not on the list I'd had to submit beforehand in Moscow. And there has been talk of an Islamic underground led by unofficial mullahs that operates outside Soviet control. But it seems that the recorded prayers of the official mullahs will increasingly be left to echo around empty mosques as the tourists take over from the faithful in a society where communism, not Allah, is great. Martin Lewis, News at 10 in Soviet Central Asia.